Christopher Beeston is one of the trendsetters in the Jacobean theatre. He's somebody we know had been a boy actor with the King's Men. He trained under Augustine Phillips, who's one of the casts of Shakespeare's plays, as mentioned in the first folio. But Beeston goes on to be much more notable as a manager than as an actor. Uh, he really sets himself up to be the competition to the King's Men first with a group called Queen Anne's Men. You know, they're the King's Men, and this is the company who are, you know, have as their patron the Queen instead, uh, Anne, Anne of Denmark. And later, he does the same thing again. When they're the King's Men under King Charles I, he's, they become the Queen's Men under Queen Henrietta, Henrietta Maria, after, after 1625. Like Henslow in the previous generation, he runs two theatres uh, for different clientels in slightly different parts of London. Um, he's flexible that way and very intelligent at tapping the biggest market he can. He has a place called the Red Bull in Clerkenwell where he tends to put on adventure plays and the Red Bull becomes notorious as a sort of rowdy, fun-loving, very pubbish theatre where, where people you know, are tremendously responsive and keen and, and excited and, and it puts on plays that are to a slightly kind of naive or old-fashioned taste involving pirates and running around the continent and, and having battles and adventures. But he's also very important for moving the theatre much more into the West End, for pioneering uh, the indoor theatre. Well, I mean, he doesn't pioneer it. He follows the King's Men in this because they've had the Blackfriars, this nice little hall playhouse since 1608, and he gets hold of a cockpit on Drury Lane, you know, he's the first person to make Drury Lane into a theatrical uh, address. He buys a cockpit in 1616, where there are people you know, setting chickens to, to kill each other, and gets it converted into a theatre, just opposite the end of Martlick Court on, on Drury Lane. Um, and it's really shocking that there's no plaque there, no replica, nothing. You know, underneath somebody's front room in an old 30s council block is what's left of uh, the cockpit. The cockpit he has fitted up uh, as a theatre, and it becomes his venue where he can charge higher admission prices, and because it's got a lid on it, he can run it all winter. So it's got a longer season, uh, smaller audience, but higher admission prices, and that seems to pay him pretty well. And in there, he tends to put on Jacobean tragedy. Uh, it's where Middleton and Rowley's The Changeling was first performed, it's where uh, now, actually, the White Devil he puts on at the Red Bull, and it's a disaster. Uh, but he put on a lot of James Shirley plays there, quite sophisticated comedies that are set in contemporary London, and that's one of the things that uh, he becomes associated with, with, as I say, James Shirley, sort of as his house playwright. He's not necessarily a very nice person. Uh, we know quite a lot about his business dealings. He seems to have bribed the censor, Henry Herbert, uh, by giving him a share in one of his theatres and by buying expensive gloves for his wife to make sure that he stayed in favour with the authorities. And he also got charged with rape in 1602, which seems to have been the incident that resulted in him leaving the King's Men. Uh, he becomes this kind of outlaw figure who then becomes, as I say, the competition to the King's Men. But he's an important person. He's, he's got his finger in lots of pies, uh, in the theatre business across London. Uh, Salisbury Court Playhouse he's involved with as well, which is another one of these nice new high-tech indoor places that are in the West End, north of the river, in you know, what people had thought of as respectable neighbourhoods. Uh, and you know, he pioneers this kind of more exclusive theatre that's for courtiers at the same time as continuing to run a fairly nostalgic, old-fashioned, rough-and-tumble Elizabethan theatre down at the Red Bull. In Beeston's time, in later Jacobean London, the whole social geography of the city is beginning to tip westwards. You've got a bigger court, you've got more people settling in what are becoming very fashionable neighbourhoods, and they still want entertainment, but they don't necessarily want to go to sleazy Southwark to get it. Uh, in Beeston's time, Covent Garden gets built. This incredible um, housing come retail development that's like nothing London's ever seen and it's all made of stone, it looks permanent, it looks Italianate, it's got clean lines, it's incredibly trendy. Uh, if you think of the rest of London at the time, which is all sort of you know, half-timbered, thatch, wattle and daub, and then this uh, 
place where you can have an apartment or a townhouse that's tall and overlooks a marketplace, um, people who are settling there, who are you know, on the make, on the rise, associated with the court, they want a different kind of theatre and they're prepared to pay for it. And having the cockpit just around the corner from Covent Garden means he's there to tap that market. Uh, it really, it's the beginnings of the West End as the theatre district. It, it's all the tendencies that we see in theatre that we associate with the restoration. Fashionable comedies about the kind of fashionable people who are in the audience are already happening at the cockpit from about 1617 onwards. There are some beautiful drawings which have been identified as Inigo Jones drawings of the cockpit. In fact, some people think they're actually by John Webb, Inigo Jones' nephew, and then they might be from a later structure. They're about, they suggest something about the right size, and the decorative detail is very like the decorative detail on some drawings we know are by Inigo Jones for a different theatre called the Cockpit in Court, just to confuse everybody, which was a little square theatre and even smaller. But um, it's, these are the drawings that are currently being built at the, uh, at the Replica Globe on the South Bank, so it would be nice to think they were Inigo Jones drawings. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the main thing we know is that whatever this building was, it was lovely. I mean, it's a really nice design. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit like the Swan in Stratford except with more sort of porticos and neoclassical detailing on it. A little thrust stage, horseshoe-shaped auditorium, uh, two doors, pillars, an upper level. You know, it's just what you want. Everything we know about the site and everything we have from early drawings and plans of the district suggests that the cockpit was that kind of theatre. It had a thrust stage that it probably didn't seat more than about 500 people at the most. So it's intimate, it's got artificial lighting, uh, and it's got a stage with people sitting around three sides of it and probably paying extra to sit on the stage and pose uh, as people did. Well, the West End is close to the Inns of Court, so you've got rich law students, you've indeed got rich lawyers. I mean, there's a, a substantial growing legal population. There's a growing body of administrators who are actually associated with the court and hold court offices. Uh, and there are fashionable, upwardly mobile merchants who've, sp who've spilled out from the walls of the city and want to live you know, closer to the court, uh, closer to the legal business, uh, closer to the markets. On Shrove Tuesday, 1617, uh, a bunch of apprentices came and tried to demolish the cockpit theatre uh, and indeed tried to set fire to it, which is one reason it then became known as the Phoenix after it, after it was rebuilt. And there are sort of two stories about this incident. One of them is that it's just part of a pattern of apprentices burning things down on Shrove Tuesday because that's what you do. It's, it's about the only day off you get all year, so obviously you're going to go and burn something down. And they would attack brothels in particular. Anything that had any kind of, if there was the remotest pretext for attacking something, theatre's a bit naughty, a bit like brothels. Why don't we burn this one down, lads? Um, but the other story is that actually these men have been apprentices who were used to going and seeing Beeston's actors performing at the Red Bull, where it was cheap and noisy and you know, their favourite local sort of drunken pub theatre. And that when Beeston transferred his theatre company to the cockpit and started charging much higher admission prices, they were fed up and that this was a sort of, you know, it's a bit like the old price riots a couple of hundred years later, that this is a disgruntled theatre audience who, who want to see their favourite shows cheap. Uh, so it could have been a mixture of the two, perhaps. You know, certainly they were drunk. In general, the plays that are on at the cockpit ha contain a better class of character. They're not as necessarily bashors or tamburlaine or sort of great thundering heroes, but in comedy they tend to be gentlemen. It's more like Beaumont and Fletcher, what Shirley does. Uh, and some of it's set in London. Some of it is plays that depict exactly the kind of people who are sitting in the audience with you. So plays like Shirley's Hyde Park, 
plays like The Mulberry Garden, plays that are actually set in recognisable locations in London where merchants and citizens and courtiers are competing with each other and competing as to who's best dressed and who's most fashionable and so forth. So the sort of social experience of play going is very much reflected in what's happening on the stage, a kind of rivalry as to you know, what your status is and, and you know, whether you understand what's going on better than the people next to you, which is just what's happening to the characters. And in tragedy, Jacobean tragedy, again, it's often about unsuccessful courtiers, disgruntled, disaffected, malcontented courtiers who are trying to get on in the world but can't, except you know, maybe by temporarily by prostituting their sisters and then they wind up having to murder several people and it's all rather terrible. But at least it's in a refined court atmosphere. You know, it's a better class of sarcasm and disaffection that you're seeing represented. A Fair Quarrel by Middleton and Rowley is a terrific comedy which is very much about status uh, and class and codes of honour. Uh, there's a main plot in which a soldier is obsessed with his own honour and can't bear and can't rec can barely reconcile himself to existing, and especially when he thinks his mother has done something wicked. Uh, and in the subplot, there's this brilliant Cornish idiot who's come to London and is trying to learn to be a successful braggart and duelist and, and sort of star of the bar room. Uh, and this competition for status... Uh, this competition as to who's got the right code and who's reading the social mores properly uh, is very much what drives the play forwards. And it suggests an audience who are themselves sort of on their mettle, who are themselves making judgments about uh, you know, who's eating their orange in the coolest way and who's come to London most recently. Beeston is very central to the theatre in the 1620s, 30s and very early 40s before it closes down because he's running both the survival of the Elizabethan theatre, both the stuff that hadn't changed at all, the audiences who still wanted to see Titus Andronicus and the Jew of Malta and Tamburlaine, and he's putting that stuff on for them at the Red Bull. So to some extent, the popular Elizabethan theatre didn't disappear just because Shakespeare died. It just carried on happening and, and, and often revived the same old plays. But at the same time, he's promoting new plays which are much closer in outlook to the court. Uh, he's working with playwrights who are half courtiers rather than people who've dropped out of university and fallen in among the players. Uh, you know, he's familiar with people like Sir William Davenant, who is a Caroline courtier and who's writing court entertainments for Henrietta Maria, which are incredibly refined, um, almost etiolated, some of them, with, with you know, notions about platonic love. Uh, and who's going to become a theatre manager in the next generation after, after 1660 and who'll be terribly important. But that overlap between, at the one end, the theatre and the court, and at the other end, the theatre and the pubs, you know, Beeston straddles it. All of that stuff is very much alive in the 20s and 30s. In some ways, there are continuities despite the interruption of the Civil War, and what's happening in the 1630s just starts happening again in the 1660s. Uh, Thomas Betterton gets, makes his debut at the cockpit, we think, under Rhodes in the late 1650s as, as theatre companies come out into the open again. A lot of the people who'd worked for Beeston in Queen Henrietta's Men wound up working for the King's Men under Davenant after 1660. Uh, the players didn't forget their trade. Some of them carried it on surreptitiously. Some of them joined the Royalist Army and then came out again and were better at stage sword fights than ever. Uh, but that sort of court drama, it just comes up again. Um, in a way, you just get a fusion between the different bits of Beeston's business after 1660, when putting on court entertainments and putting on public theatre become the same thing, because mainly, instead of having court entertainment done at the palace, Charles II just has it put on at a semi-public theatre and goes to see it there, along with everybody else. At the end of Beast, what turns out to be the end of Beeston's career, Charles I declares personal rule. The court cuts itself off much more from Parliament. Uh, court entertainments become much more of a minority event and rather beleaguered in their tone in the stuff that gets written for them. 
Um, the theatres get closed down, not so much because everybody suddenly decided that theatre was wicked, but simply because there was a war on. The reason that's, a, that's the official reason the theatres are closed is simply that you know, there's a civil war, it's not appropriate for people to be you know, keeping their places of entertainment open, and that you, know, you ought to be in the army or, or praying for deliverance. Uh, and when the, when the uh, interregnum collapses, you know, it all springs up again. I think one of the important things about Beeston in the long term is that when the theatre revives, it's the indoor theatre that revives, uh, and it's right round the corner from the cockpit. You know, when Christopher Wren builds his great theatrical masterpiece, it's the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's, it's about 20 yards from where the cockpit stood. That theatre that's close to the court uh, is the one that we then get for the next two, three hundred years.